So here I have a sample of the original Lua code pulled up, now hosted on GitHub as well, by the way. Basically, a few years ago, I humbly announced that the code for the entire project was up and open for anyone who wants a peek. A sort of use at your own risk kind of thing. But if anyone remembers trying to toy around with any of it, you probably remember getting a lot of really unhelpful error messages. This was the biggest design flaw with my old code. Back then, I sort of had a just wing it mentality to see if I could get anything up and running. Yeah, that was a that was very much a mistake. For this episode though, I'll redo the first crucial step I took toward file input so many years ago, coding the base64 parser. Essentially, how do I take any MIDI file I'd like and upload it in such a way that my Lua scripts can read it? For this, you'll need to know one thing. All files stored on your computer right now are binary data. All of them. From the computer's point of view, it has no notion of what even is a MIDI file. For example, here in an instance of Sublime Text, this is obvious. I drag in an example MIDI file into it, and we see as we expect. The file is nothing more than a sequence of numbers, bytes in hexadecimal to be exact. Now, because as far as I'm aware, there's no way to directly store binary data onto Roblox, we'll need a workaround. It would be nice to have our data accessible through a Lua string. Luckily, Fitting arbitrary data into plain text is the inaugural challenge Base64 was designed to solve. So the rest of this video will be dedicated to writing exactly that. Well, to start off we're going to need some data, so I have on my computer a medium sized MIDI file which I'll be using for the rest of this video. Using a tool I wrote a couple days ago, I'll convert it into a Lua ready Base64 string and paste it directly into its own module script. Module scripts are pretty much Roblox's way of keeping data or tables in Lua code. They're pretty much analogous to header files in the C language. For this project, I'll be using one regular script object as the start of execution, the main function if you will. Here the require keyword just tells the interpreter this is some data I would like to retrieve. Our main script should be nothing more than a simplified overview of what we are accomplishing with our program. It's, by the way, it's perfectly valid to sketch out the look of your code before you even write out all the functions. Now, because it's possible for our program to encounter invalid input, we account for a possible failed parse. It's very easy for someone to, say, mistakenly delete a single character from the input string, and it's up to our code to detect and report that error as early as possible. The comma before the equal sign is syntax for a multi-return statement. Lua, unlike most programming languages, allows functions which return more than one value. It's a nifty little feature I'll be taking full advantage of in the next episode as well. So let's reorganize our files a little bit before creating a new utilities module script to store our base64 parser. This is the real meat and potatoes of this lesson. At the top here, I'm defining a couple constants. Even if our base64 format is unlikely to change in the future, it's still good practice to separate data from code in our programs. Right after, to aid in legibility, there are a few helper functions. Yes, functions inside other functions are valid Lua syntax. In fact, in this language, functions are just variables like any other. In this case, even though the tasks they perform are very simple, it greatly improves code legibility further down the line whenever we name what we're doing instead of only saying how we're doing it. On line 17, we see our first example of the multi-return syntax in action. Remember how the main script expected two values from our parse64 function? This is exactly that. A single value return is also allowed and is seen in the bottom of our code. Lua will automatically fill in the second return value with nil in that case, Lua's equivalent for null. Now we get into the base64 logic itself. Are you ready? Here's a simplified diagram from the Wikipedia article on base64. On the top, we have six binary digits per base64 character. For each tuple of four characters in our input, we want to reinterpret it as three bytes and store them all together in a string. But because the base64 standard is a little bit more complex than this, we'll have to modify our code just a little bit to account for possible padded input at the end of the last tuple. Now, there's a curious looking syntax on this line right here. In programming, whenever there's a frequently occurring pattern in a language, we like to call it an idiom. 
Here's an example of a Lua idiom that simply means, if is last is true, pretend we wrote a two right here. Otherwise, pretend we wrote a four. It's an almost equivalent emulation of C's ternary operator. Really, it's just a fancy way of doing an if statement in line. While it's always possible to write code with the same behavior without the funny and or syntax, in my experience, it's often valuable to allow brevity in our code. Our complete function reads as follows. Par64 is a utility function which takes in base64 data and returns an expected string. If our input is empty, or not a multiple of 4, we report an error to the user. Otherwise, store every 4 base64 digits into a table called tuples. For each digit in each tuple, if it's not a valid character where we expect it, return an error. Otherwise, there are three valid cases for the end of a base64 string. If it is not the first case, and it is not the second case, and it is not the third, it's an error. If all other checks have passed, then we're ready to transform our data and push each triplet of bytes onto our result string. So let's see if our function does as we expect, shall we? So I'll hit F8 to run. Well, it seems to be correct. I do see a MIDI header and track header in there. Everything else is less than readable though. This is because we gave Lua no specification on how to print our data, so it just defaulted to displaying each byte as its equivalent ASCII character, more or less. Let's help it out a little with another utility function. As a side note, when preparing this video I considered using an alternate version of this for loop right here. Here you can see both side by side. As is often in programming, there will be multiple ways of writing code that does the same thing but it's really down to preference for how you would like to spell it out. Anyways, let's give this code one more try. Ah, cool. It looks just like our sublime text view from earlier. And if I go in, you can see all the bytes match. I could, I could do a more thorough check, but I think this is good enough for now. Well, anyways, this concludes episode one of our Pipe Dream rewrite series. Uh, we now have a fully implemented file to Roblox system in our code, which allows arbitrary binary input to be read by any Lua script that we desire. Stay tuned for the next episode where I take a look at the MIDI file format and interpret our prepared binary data as MIDI file input. Anyways, until next time, y'all have a wonderful rest of your day and goodbye.